So I'm going to continue to read uh, Charlotte's Web. Um, today we'll be reading chapters three and four, continuing along in our book. Oops. And um, I am recording this. So let me pull up my screen here with our notes so you guys can get started um, on that. Uh, Sefa, put your name on your paper and everybody else. And today's date is the 14th. So it is your name and it's the 4 14th of 20th so please add that to there and we are reading charlotte's web and we'll be doing chapters three and four so go ahead and write those out um, and if you are on with me it looks like your um, video icon does join the recording so you're down on the bottom quarter there. Just want to make sure you guys are aware of that. Um, I will see if I can find a way to handle that. By this point, you guys are on as well. Just no um, sound. Um, so this will be shared out to YouTube when we are done. <clears throat> so chapter three is escape. The barn was very large. It was very old. It smelled of hay and it smelled of manure. It smelled of perspiration of tired horses and wonderful sweet breath of patient cows. It often had a sort of peaceful smell as though nothing bad could happen ever again in the world. It smelled of grain and of harness dressing and of axle grease and of rubber boots and of new rope. And whenever the cat was given a fresh head to eat, the barn would smell of fish, but mostly it smelled of hay. For there was always hay in the greater loft of overhead. And there was always hay being pitched down to the cows and the horses and the sheep. The barn was pleasantly warm in winter when the animals spent most of their time indoors, and it was pleasantly cool in summer when the big door stood wide open to the breeze. The barn had stalls on the main floor for the workhorses, tie-ups on the main floor for the cows, a sheep fold down below for the sheep, a pig pen down below for Wilbur, and it was full of all sorts of things you could find in barns. Ladders, grindstones, pitchforks, monkey wrenches, size, Lawn mowers, snow shovels, axe handles, milk pails, water buckets, empty grain sacks, and rusty rat traps. It's the kind of barn that swallows like to build their nest in. It's the kind of barn that children like to play in. And the whole thing was owned by Fern's uncle, Mr. Homer L. Zuckerman. Wilbur's new home was in the lower part of the barn, directly underneath the cows. Mr. Zuckerman knew that a manure pile was a good place to keep a young pig. Pigs need warmth, and it was warm and comfortable down there in the barn cellar on the south side. Fern came almost every day to visit him. She found an old milking stool that had been discarded and the place of stool in the sheepfold next to Wilbur's pen. Here she sat quietly during the long afternoons thinking and listening and watching Wilbur. The sheep, sheep soon got to know her and trust her. So did the geese who lived with the sheep. All the animals trusted her and she was, she was so quiet and friendly. Mr. Zuckerman did not allow her to take Wilbur out and he did not allow her to get into the pig pen but he told Fern that she could sit on the stool and watch Wilbur as long as she wanted to. It made her happy just to be near the pig, and it made Wilbur happy to know that she was sitting there right outside his pen, but he never had any fun, no walks, no rides, no swims. So our first thing is that Fern has come almost every day to see Wilbur. Um, so she would come visit him. She wasn't allowed to go in and play with him or take him out but she did come and sit by his little gate and would talk to them. So go ahead and uh, copy number one while I continue to read. <clears throat> one afternoon in June, when Wilbur was almost two months old, he wandered out into a small yard outside the barn. Fern had not arrived for a usual visit. Wilbur stood in the sun feeling lonely and bored. There's never anything to do around here, he thought. He walked slowly to his food trough and sniffed it to see if anything had been overlooked at lunch. He found a small strip of potato skin and ate it. He, his back itched, so he leaned against the fence and rubbed against the boards. When he tired of this, he walked indoors, climbed to the top of the newer pot, manure pile, and sat down. He didn't feel like going to sleep. He didn't feel like digging. 
He was tired of standing still, tired of lying down. I'm less than two months old and I'm tired of living, he said. He walked out to the yard again. When I'm out here, he said, there's no place to go but in. When I'm indoors, there's no place to go but out in the yard. That's where you're wrong, my friend, my friend, said a voice. Wilbur looked to the fence and saw the goose standing there. You don't have to stay in that dirty little, dirty little, dirty little yard, said the goose, who talked rather fast. One of the boards is loose. Push on it, push, push, push on it, and come on out. What, said Wilbur, say it slower. At, 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 at the risk of repeating myself, said the goose, I suggest that you come on out. It's wonderful out here. Did you say a board was loose? That I did, that I did, said the goose. Wilbur walked up to the fence and saw that the goose was right. One board was loose. He put his head down, shut his eyes and pushed. The board gave way. In a minute, he had squeezed through the fence and was standing in the long grass outside his yard. The goose chuckled. How does it feel to be free, she asked. I like it, said Wilbur. That is, I guess I like it. Actually, Wilbur felt queer to be outside his fence with nothing between him and the big world. Where do you think I better go? Anywhere you like, anywhere you like, said the goose. Go down through the orchard, root up the sod. Go down through the garden, dig up the radishes. Root up everything, eat grass, look for corn. Look for oats, run all over, skip and dance, jump and prance. Go down through the orchard and stroll in the woods. The world is a wonderful place when you're young. I can see that, replied Wilbur. He gave a jump in the air, twirled, ran a few steps, stopped, looked all around, sniffed the smells of the afternoon, and set off walking down through the orchard. Pausing in the shade of an apple tree, he put his strong snout into the ground and began pushing, digging, and rooting. He felt very happy. He had plowed up quite a piece of ground before anyone noticed him. Miss Zuckerman was the first to see him. She saw him from the kitchen window and she immediately shouted for the men. Homer, she cried, pigs out, Lurvy, pigs out. Homer, Lurvy, pigs out. He's down there under that apple tree. Now the trouble starts, thought Wilbur. Now I'll catch it. The goose heard the racket and she too started hollering. Run, 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 downhill, make for the woods, the woods, she shouted to Wilbur. They'll never, never, never catch you in the woods. A cocker spaniel heard the commotion and he ran up from the barn to join the chase. Mr. Zuckerman heard and he came out of the machine shed where he was mending the tool. Lurvy, the hired man, heard the noise and came up from the asparagus patch where he was pulling weeds. Everybody walked toward Wilbur and Wilbur didn't know what to do. The woods seemed a long way off and anyway, he had never been down there in the woods and wasn't sure he would like it. Get around behind him, Lurvy, said Mr. Zuckerman, and drive him toward the barn and take it easy, don't rush him. I'll go and get the bucket of slops. The news of Wilbur's escape spread rapidly through the around among the animals on the place. Whenever any creature broke loose on Zuckerman's farm, the event was of great interest to the others. The goose shouted to the nearest cow that Wilbur was free, and soon all the cows knew. Then one of the cows told one of the sheep, and soon all the sheep knew. The lambs learned about it from their mothers. The horses in their stalls in the barn pricked up their ears when they heard the goose hollering and soon the horses had caught on to what was happening. Wilbur's out, they said. Every animal stirred and lifted its head and became excited to know that one of his friends had got free, was no longer penned up or tied fast. Wilbur didn't know what to do or which way to run. It seemed as though everybody was after him. If this is what it's like to be free, he thought, I believe I'd rather be penned up in my own yard. The Cocker Spaniel was speaking up, sneaking up on him from one side. Lurvy the hired man was sneaking up on him from another side. Miss Zuckerman stood ready to head him off if he started for the garden, and now Mr. Zuckerman was coming down toward him carrying a pail. This is really awful, thought Wilbur. Why doesn't Fern come? He began to cry. The goose took command and began to give orders. Don't just stand there, Wilbur. Dodge about, dodge about, cried the goose. Skip around, run around toward me. Slip in and out, in and out, in and out. Make for the woods. Twist and turn. The cocker spaniel sprang at Wilbur's hind leg. Wilbur jumped and ran. Lurvy reached out and grabbed. Mr. Zuckerman screamed at Lurvy. The goose cheered at Wilbur. Wilbur dodged between Lurvy's legs. Lurvy, Lurvy missed Wilbur and grabbed the spaniel instead. Nicely done, nicely done, cried the goose. Try it again, try it again. Run downhill, suggested the cows. Run toward me, yelled the gander. Run uphill, cried the sheep. Turn and twist, honked the goose. Jump and dance, said the rooster. Look out for Lurvy, called the cows. 
Look out for Zuckerman, yelled the gander. Watch out for the dog, cried the sheep. Listen to me, listen to me, screamed the goose. Poor Wilbur was dazed and frightened by this hullabaloo. He didn't like being the center of all this fuss. He tried to follow the instructions his friends were giving him, but he couldn't run downhill and uphill at the same time. And he couldn't turn and twist when he was jumping and dancing. And he was crying so hard he could barely see anything that was happening. After all, Wilbur was a very young pig, not much more than a baby, really. He wished Fern were there to take him in her arms and comfort him. When he looked up and saw Mr. Zuckerman standing quite close to him, holding a pail of warm slops, he felt relieved. He lifted his nose and sniffed. The smell was delicious. Warm milk, potato skins, wheat middlings, Kellogg's cornflakes, and a popover left from Zuckerman's breakfast. Come, pig, said Mr. Zuckerman, tapping the pail. Come, pig. Wilbur took a step toward the pail. No, 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 said the goose. It's the old pail trick. Wilbur, don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. He's trying to lure you back into captivity. -ivity. He's appealing to your stomach. Wilbur didn't care. The food smelled appetizing. He took another step toward the pail. Pig, pig, said Mr. Zuckerman in a kind voice, and began walking slowly toward the barnyard, looking all about him innocently, as if he didn't know what a little white pig was falling along behind him. You'll be sorry, 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 called the goose. Wilbur didn't care. He kept walking toward the pail of slops. You'll miss your freedom, honked the goose. An hour of freedom is worth a barrel of slops. Wilbur didn't care. When Mr. Zuckerman reached the pig pen, he climbed over the fence and poured the slops into the trough. Then he pulled the loose board away from the fence so that there was a wide hole for Wilbur to walk through. Reconsider, reconsider, cried the goose. Wilbur paid no attention. He stepped through the fence into his yard. He walked through the trough and looked, took a long drink of slops, sucking in the milk hungrily and chewing the popover. It was good to be home again. While Wilbur ate, Lurby fetched a hammer and some eight penny nails and nailed the board in place. Then he and Mr. Zuckerman leaned lazily on the fence, and Mr. Zuckerman scratched Wilbur's back with a stick. He's quite a pig, said Lurvy. Yes, he'll make a good pig, said Mr. Zuckerman. Wilbur heard the words of praise. He felt the warm milk inside his stomach. He felt pleasant rubbing of the stick along his inchy back. He felt peaceful and happy and sleepy. This had been a tiring afternoon. It was still only about four o'clock, but Wilbur was ready for bed. I'm really too young to go out into the world alone, he thought as he lay down. All right, so that's the end of our next chap uh, first chapter, uh, chapter three. Uh, but Wilbur um, escapes from his pen and runs around and plays outside. And eventually they capture him and they use their, um, his food. They give him food to get him back in. So you can copy our second note down now. And I will begin reading chapter four, which is titled Loneliness. And it is not nearly as long, so it should be a little shorter. The next day was rainy and dark. Rain fell on the roof of the barn and dripped sadly from the eaves. Rain fell in the barnyard and ran in crooked courses down into the lane where thistles and the pigweed grew. Rain spattered against Mr. Zuckerman's kitchen windows and came gushing out of the downspouts. Rain fell on the backs of the sheep as they grazed in the meadow. When the sheep tire, tired of standing in the rain, they walked slowly up the lane and into the fold. Rain upset Wilbur's plans. Wilbur had planned to go out this day and dig a new hole in his yard. He had other plans too. His plans for the day went something like this. Breakfast at 6.30, skim milk, crusts, middlings, bits of donuts, wheat cakes with drops of maple syrup sticking to them, potato skins, leftover custard pudding with raisins, and bits of shredded wheat. Breakfast would be finished at seven. From seven to eight, Wilbur planned to have a talk with Templeton, the rat that lived under his trough. Talking with Templeton was not that the most interesting occupation in the world, but it was better than nothing. From eight to nine, Wilbur planned to take a nap outdoors in the sun. From nine to 11, he planned to dig a hole or trench and possibly find something good to eat buried in the dirt. From 11 to 12, he planned to stand still and watch flies on the boards, watch bees in the clover, and watch swallows in the air. 12 o'clock, lunchtime, middlings, warm at water, apple parings, meat gravy, carrot scrapings, meat scraps, stale hominy, and a wrapper off a package of cheese. Lunch would be over at one. From one to two, Wilbur planned to sleep. From two to three, he planned to scratch itchy places by rubbing against the fence. From three to four, he planned to stand perfectly still and think of what it was like to be alive and to wait for fern. At four would come supper, skim milk, provender, leftover sandwich from Lurie's lunchbox, prune skins, 
a morsel of this, a bit of that, fried potatoes, marmalade drippings, a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that, a piece of baked apple, a scrap of upside down cake. Wilbur had gone to sleep thinking about these plans. He woke up, he woke at six and saw the rain. It seemed as though he couldn't bear it. I get everything all beautifully planned out and it has to go in rain, he said. For a while he stood gloomily indoors, then he walked to the door and looked out. Drops of rain struck his face. His yard was cold and wet. His trough had an inch of rainwater in it. Templeton was nowhere to be seen. And you out there, Templeton, crawled Wilbur. So there was no answer. Suddenly Wilbur felt lonely and friendless. One day, just like another, he groaned. I'm very young. I have no real friend here in the barn. It's going to rain all morning and all afternoon and fern won't come in such bad weather. Oh, honestly. And Wilbur was crying again for the second time in two days. At 6.30, Wilbur heard the banging of a pail. Lurvy was standing outside in the rain, stirring up breakfast. Come on, pig, said Lurvy. Wilbur did not budge. Lurvy dumped the slops, scraped the pail, and walked away. He noticed that something was wrong with the pig. Wilbur didn't want food. He wanted love. He wanted a friend, someone who would play with him. He mentioned this to the goose, who was sitting quietly in the corner of the sheepfold. Will you come over and play with me, he asked. Sorry, sonny, sorry, said the goose. I'm sitting, sitting on my eggs. Eight of them, got to keep them toasty, oasty, oasty warm. I have to stay right here. I'm no flibberty, iberty, give it. I do not play when there are eggs to hatch. I expect goslings. Well, I didn't think you were expecting woodpeckers, said Wilbur bitterly. Wilbur next tried one of the lambs. Will you please play with me, he asked. Certainly not, said the lamb. In the first place, I cannot get into your pen, as I am not old enough to jump over the fence. In the second place, I am not interested in pigs. Pigs mean less than nothing to me. What do you mean, less than nothing, replied Wilbur. I don't think there's much any such thing as less than nothing. Nothing is absolutely the limit of nothingness. It's the lowest you can go. It's the end of the line. How can something be less than nothing? If there was something then that was less than nothing, then nothing would not be nothing. It would be something. Even though it's just a very bit of something, but it's, if nothing is nothing, then nothing has nothing that is less than it is. Oh, be quiet, said the lamb. Go play with yourself. I don't play with pigs. Sadly, Wilbur lay down and listened to the rain. Soon he saw the rat climbing down a slanting board and that he used as a stairway. Will you play with me, Templeton? asked Wilbur. Play, said Templeton, twirling his whiskers. Play? I hardly know the meaning of the word. Well, said Wilbur, it means to have fun, to frolic, to run and skip and make merry. I never do those things if I can avoid them, replied the rat sourly. I prefer to spend my time eating, gnawing, spying, and hiding. I am a glutton, but not a merrymaker. Right now I'm on my way to your trough to eat your breakfast, as you haven't got sense enough to eat it yourself. And Templeton the rat crept stealthily along the wall, disappeared into a private tunnel that he had dug between the door and the trough in Wilbur's yard. Templeton was a crafty rat, and he had things pretty much his own way. The tunnel was an example of his skill and cunning. The tunnel enabled him to get from the barn to his hiding place under the pig trough without coming out into the open. He had tunnels and runways all over Mr. Zuckerman's farm, could get from one place to another without being seen. Usually he slept during the daytime and he was abroad only after dark. Wilbur watched him disappear into his tunnel. In the moment, moment he saw the rat's sharp nose poke out from underneath the wooden trough, cautiously Templeton pulled himself up over the edge of the trough. This was almost more than Wilbur could stand. On this dreary rainy day to see his breakfast being eaten by somebody else. He knew Templeton was getting soaked out there in the pouring rain, but even that didn't comfort him. Friendless, dejected, and hungry, he threw himself down the manure and sobbed. Late that afternoon, Lurby went to Mr. Zuckerman. I think there's something wrong with that pig of yours. He hasn't touched his food. Give him two spoonfuls of sulfur and a little molasses, said Mr. Zuckerman. Wilbur couldn't believe what was happening to him when Lurby caught him and forced the medicine down his throat. This was certainly the worst day of his life. He didn't know whether he could endure the awful loneliness anymore. Darkness settled over everything. Soon there were only shadows and noises of sheep chewing their cuds and occasionally the rattle of a cow chain up overhead. You can imagine Wilbur's surprise when out of the darkness came a small voice he had never heard before. It sounded rather thin, but pleasant. 
Do you want a friend, Wilbur? It said. I'll be a friend to you. I've watched you all day and I like you. But I can't see you, said Wilbur, jumping to his feet. Where are you and who are you? I'm right up here, said the voice. Go to sleep. You'll see me in the morning. So that's the end of our chapter four. And so we learned in there that Wilbur felt lonely. He was trapped inside with nobody to play with. So with the rain, Wilbur didn't want to go outside and get wet, and nobody in the barn would play with him. So he was stuck there all by himself to, I guess, stare at the walls in the rain. So go ahead and get the third um, one there. I am going to stop recording. If I can this way, there we go.